I am thrilled to see many of you. I want to let you know I'm physically exhausted. And I am grateful for what Byron shared, but I think uh, more importantly, you didn't add that I am a sinner. And that's an important part of who I am. I thank God for his work of reforming the church over these 500 years. I was able to visit Germany recently and see many of the places that the reformers had been and be able to see the work that God had done. And for my to understand, there's only one deaf German believer. One. And it's great to see that God has given him the gift of faith and he still continues to work today. Let us pray. Our Father, our Lord, our God, thank you for your loving mercy. Thank you that we can see your goodness that is wide and deep and strong and gives us such a foundation that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that we preach the same gospel. We preach the same gospel. Father, I pray that you would give us hearts ready to learn. Like Jesus, that we would be like those two people on the Emmaus Road when Jesus came to them and opened the scripture to them and they were encouraged. I pray that we too would be encouraged. Father, help me to teach clearly that it would be uh, an enjoyment for the people in the audience. Ask that you would bless your people that you have called to be here. Your sheep your flock that you died for. Father, open their eyes and their hearts that they might love you more at the end of this weekend. We give all praise to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. that you all studied history in school and did you love history or did you hate history I see a little bit of both often people hate history because they did not have a good history teacher who was not able to enrich the history able to tell the the stories that really came alive and had an impact, and to see how this history impacts the present day. So those of you who aren't crazy about history, I'd ask you to put that hatred for history aside and be ready to learn, so that we can see the history of the Reformation, because it has greatly impacted us today. First of all, why is history important? Now, notice a small type. I'm sorry, I expected a much bigger screen. So maybe we can get things bigger as we go on. So history is the study of the past. So it looks at the events that have already taken place. Battery, 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 battery. <coughs> so the past causes the present and so the future. <coughs> so 
So, we declared independence from England. We were English subjects. But we are no longer English subjects, and we're not even called American subjects, we're American citizens. And that is because what happened in declaring our independence in the past has impacted where we are today. And what we do today will impact the future. So, think about the immigration issues that we're haggling over today. Whatever we do today will impact what takes place in the future. The policies that we set, the actions that we take, will impact what comes after us. And so it is important that we know history so that we can understand who we are because we understand where we've come from. Winston Churchill, the leader of Britain during World War II, once said, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. If you don't learn from history, you will make the same <laughs> mistakes over and over again. If you learn from the mistakes of history, then you do not have to repeat them. Learning from those mistakes makes you wiser. months ago, I ran into my sixth grade teacher. Uh, that teacher was hearing, but did some. So, I hadn't seen him for many years. And I ran into him recently at one of our high school um, homecomings. And we talked for a while, caught up. And I told him how excited I was to be going to Germany. And he asked what I was going to Germany for. This is the five, I told him this is the 500th year anniversary of Martin Luther and the 95 Theses. And he didn't even know who Martin Luther was. I was shocked. So I spelled it slower in case he hadn't caught it. You know Martin Luther, the German reformer, and he is a hearing person and did not know who Martin Luther was. So again, I spelled it even more slowly. I said, Martin Luther, remember the guy who uh, hammered the 95 Theses to the Wittenberg door and started the Reformation? And he still didn't even know who was that. Excuse me, who that was. And I was shocked that he, my sixth grade teacher wouldn't know who Martin Luther was. Anyway. In Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9, it says, Remember the formless things of old. Remember what happened in the past. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. So this is God. Telling us to remember history. And if God says it, then we should remember history. And not only should we just do it out of obedience, as, and because we have to do it without joy, but we should joyfully study the past. Ecclesiastes 3.14. I know that whatever God does, it will be forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing taken from it. God does it. That mentioned fear before him. This is speaking of God's sovereignty. From eternity past to eternity future. He reigns and will continue to reign. And this is the God who is telling you to remember his history. Most importantly, remember his son Jesus. 
Could we ever forget Jesus? And we do forget, which is why the gospel is not spreading like it was before. So what happens is this ancient history seems as if it was only yesterday. So that, I, yeah, excuse me, so that all we remember is recent history. Now, there's no way that I could cover that 500 years of history, so I would just pick and choose a few representatives. How many of you have heard of John Wycliffe? Maybe you've heard of Wycliffe? The Wycliffe um, Bible translators? Now, John Wycliffe was English. Pretty old in this picture. And he has been referred to as the morning star of the Reformation. Because if we look at what precipitated the Reformation, we go back to see that John Wycliffe was the spark that lit the fire of the Reformation. So that's why we refer to him as the morning sun. He came and he, he came into darkness and the light began to spread because of what John Wycliffe did. So let's look at what he did. He was Catholic. <laughs> he believed that people must be able to read the Bible themselves. Now, you understand that at that time, the Bible was only available in Latin. And there were not that many people who could read Latin. And so they would go to church, and they wouldn't understand any of the Latin. The priests would preach in Latin, and they had no idea what was being said. Or if they preached even in their own language, they had no way to check if what they were preaching matched the Bible, because they didn't know Latin. So the people could not have, did not have the Bible in their language. Wycliffe did not believe that was right. He believed that people should be able to read the Bible for themselves. And so, he went ahead and translated the Bible into English without the authority or the approval of the Roman Catholic Church. So he translated the Bible from Latin into English. And that began to rock the world. And his influence is still felt today. For example, have you noticed how many deaf people are out there working on translations of the Bible in American Sign Language? I'm wondering, when was the first time you heard of somebody translating the Bible with ASL, most of us were resistant at first. <coughs> yeah, and that's natural. And it was the same way back that time. There were a lot of people who were resistant to having a Bible in their own language. They weren't comfortable with this big change. But Wycliffe just went ahead and did it. And today we still feel his influence. We're seeing the Bible translated into ASL. Now, is it perfect? Of course not. But wow, it is a huge step. And we're hoping that more and more deaf people will learn Greek, study theology, and we will see that become even a better translation, translation into American Sign Language from Hebrew and Greek. So I'm hopeful that that will happen. Well, I say I hope, but you know what? It will happen. I know that because of history. John Wycliffe has influenced us even today. This is interesting. 
He wrote that the Bible is for the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That sounds almost like another famous speaker. Do you know who that is? Yes, Abraham Lincoln. Exactly. That influenced his Gettysburg Address. So the Civil War, I, wait, I'm here, I guess it's the uh, war between the states, whatever you call it. Um, he said that we had a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, which he borrowed from John Wycliffe. Wow. Our American government, influenced by John Wycliffe. Imagine that. So you still think that history isn't that important? Or maybe you're beginning to waver on that? Maybe you're ready to say that it does, that it is important? There are three things that we need to be thankful John Wycliffe for. First of all, he argued that there was no biblical support for the papacy. That you would not find a pope anywhere in the Bible. The Catholic Church continued the papacy. And Wycliffe said that there was no evidence for that in the Bible. Secondly, and this was amazing for his time. He was the first to spread the idea that, the, that England did not need to support the Roman Catholic Church. There was a corrupt church. People became cardinals and popes through bribery at that time. And he said, we as the English Church do not need to support the Roman Catholic Church. And it's interesting that... Um, Later, the Church of England <coughs> split from the Catholic Church, and the seeds of that were planted long before by John Wycliffe. Thirdly, so important, he developed the doctrine, the authority of the Scripture, that the Pope was not our authority, but Scripture alone was our authority. These are three teachings that have influenced history. And we can see how those spread throughout history, even up to today. So, in uh, Czechoslovak Czech Republic, just below Germany, was John Huss. Can you see this? It looks like Jan Hus, but the English translation would be John Huss, H-U-S-S. -S. And he was influenced by Wycliffe's writings and agreed with him. He opposed indulgences. Now, maybe you don't know what indulgences are. There was a Catholic practice at that time that suppose one of your relatives had died, they didn't go straight to heaven, but went to purgatory, where they had to, it's kind of a, a place where you wait, kind of like the waiting room for heaven, till all of your sins have been dealt with and purged, and then you go to heaven. So, what they did was sold indulgences. That would allow them to have their relatives go straight to heaven without having to go through all that suffering to purge them of their sins. If they bought an indulgence for that relative, the relative would go straight to heaven. And so these heartbroken people worried about their mother having died and having to suffer. They could buy an indulgence, stamped by the church, and they could know that their mother went straight to heaven. That's what an indulgence was. And that began to spread and some began to abuse it. 
So, for example, they, somebody wanted to build a new church, they needed money, so what they would do is they would sell indulgences. And they said this thing that when a coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. And people bought into this. They thought that they could pay the money and save their relatives and absolve them of their guilt. But us was opposed to these. Now, in the Lord's Supper, well, actually the Catholic Church calls it the Mass, they just gave the bread and not the wine. But the Lord's Supper and us made it clear that the communion needed to be both the bread and the wine. So, at that time, people would go to church and the teaching tended to be in Latin, which the members didn't understand. So they would go and sit and listen to this Latin lecture that went right past them. And like in Huss Red, uh, Wycliffe said people should have the Bible in their own language. And he took that a little further, saying that they needed to have preaching in their own language. So let's imagine we had a hearing preacher come up here without an interpreter. And we've had that experience how many times? And it just goes right past us. That's what the Catholic Church was experiencing every week back at that time. And so people would go to church out of a sense of duty, but they wouldn't understand anything. They were not coming to church with joy, ready to worship, ready to enjoy and praise God in song. They would come out of duty and get nothing from it. And so Huss was against that idea. And so people would find a preacher preaching in English or preaching in their language uh, and they would, their eyes would be open, they would be so excited to learn of God. That's the influence Huss has had. And he also rejected the authority of the Pope and said that scripture was our only authority. As his teaching spread, he was excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. Excommunicated, thrown into jail, for prison for six months, given a mock trial, not really looking to find out whether he was guilty or innocent, but just going through the motions. And they ordered him to recant, to deny everything he had taught. And there's an interesting thing. I said, go ahead, kill me. And if I die, he said, if I die, a hundred years later, God will send another after me. And good enough, who's 100 years later? Martin Luther. And sure enough, there was Martin Luther. He was chained to a stake, burned alive, and as the flames burned, he sang until he died. And the Czech people were so angry, and it resulted in a war. Because they loved us. They loved that, he, that they could now have the Bible and preaching in their own language. So they were greatly upset. Well, it gives you a few years ago, the Catholic Church finally admitted they were wrong and apologized for excommunicating and killing John Huss. Maybe you don't know William Farrell.
So he tried to reform the Catholic Church from within. That was his goal, was that the Catholic Church would come back to the Bible. He wasn't leaving the Catholic Church, he fought from within. For one thing, he wrote against the use of images in Christian worship. Now, in traveling through Europe, you often see altars in churches, and you see such you'll see these shining bright images and you'll see people coming up to these images touching them asking God to bless them believing that by touching these images God would bless them how is that not idolatry? And so he believed that we did not, should not have images in our worship. And he was persecuted and forced to flee to Geneva, Switzerland. And he is the one who persuaded John Calvin come to Geneva to teach. Calvin finally gave in and did come to Geneva. And he influenced Geneva to become to the Protestant church what Rome was to the Catholic church. And I was just in Geneva And I couldn't find any of the churches. They're all gone. And the reason was that the Catholic Church hated John Calvin and wanted to destroy anything that had to do with him. So you go to Germany, Luther lived, and there's still churches around. But they destroyed everything related to John Calvin. You would have expected the same treatment. They hated Calvin so much. I find that interesting. And in Geneva, William Farrell trained many to become Protestant ministers. You know, John Knox, for example, that took the gospel and spread it throughout Europe. This is Erasmus. <coughs> and we need to be thankful for Erasmus. Erasmus was a famous Christian humanist. <coughs> Have you ever played Whisper Down the Line? You tell a story and keep your DNA down the line and it changes by the end? And often what is said at the end is not what the first person said. So we want to go back to what the first person said. So remember I mentioned the Latin Bible. It was called the Vulgate. Uh, because in Latin, Vulgate means common. And that was translated by Jerome. So that everybody had the same Latin Bible. At that time, they, 
before Jerome, they didn't have the same Bible. And they asked Jerome to translate them into Latin. So he translated from Hebrew into Latin and Greek into Latin. So they all had a common Bible. So that they weren't in conflict with each other. That was about 480. Now, moving forward to 1400. The Bible had been, the Vulgate had been changed many, many times. Are you familiar with commentaries? It's when uh, somebody explains a book in the Bible verse by verse. So they changed the scripture many, many times, but they didn't change the commentaries. people would read the commentaries and then read the, the newest translation and they were at conflict with each other. Couldn't understand why there was a difference. That the older commentaries were different than the newer translations. And they lost trust in the Bible. Because the translation had become corrupted. And so Erasmus said that we need to go back to the source of the message, like the first person to say the message, meaning the uh, Greek New Testament. And so he gathered all of the different <coughs> fragments of the Greek New Testament, and put them all together <laughs> into the New Testament in Greek. Now, interestingly, almost every future Bible translation was based on that New Testament in Greek by Erasmus. So, if you see the influence he had, you need to be thankful for it. Luther studied Erasmus' writings, as did Wingley. Martin Luther. I went to uh, Germany with a group of Korean deaf people. And they, we talked about how we had changed the sign we used for um, Germany. And then we had to change the sign we were using for Martin Luther. And what happened is that's still influencing me. But again, you see, history is important. Luther was an Augustine monk. I'm not going to go into the story of St. Yardley telling something of the story. But he became a Catholic priest. And began to criticize the Roman Catholic Church for not following the scripture, agreeing with us. This is a famous date in history. And Martin Luther did not intend to shake the world when he nailed the 95 Theses to the church door. At that time, this was the way people called for a debate. They would write down their points, they nailed up to a church door. It's like our bulletin boards that we have out here. You can go there and see what events are taking place on the bulletin board. See what kind of events are taking place, what the Sunday school classes are, what the adults will be studying, um, what we will be studying in, in Bible study. So they didn't have those bulletin boards. So he wanted to put one on the um, church door. Now, interestingly <laughs> enough, what had just taken place is the invention of the printing press. So they were able to make copies. 
So if somebody had taken a copy of Martin Luther's 95 Thesis and mm -hmm. put it up on the um, up on the door. Oh, I'm sorry. Somebody took it off the door, copied it, and that was uh, circulated throughout uh, without his permission. And there was no what, nothing you could do about it. He didn't think it was a big deal at the time, but looking back, we could see it was the biggest of deals. And we are thankful for that. And so eventually he was excommunicated from the Catholic Church. So, Frederick the Wise, and we'll see the part that takes place in the castle later. But uh, he took Luther into hiding to protect him. He really liked what Martin Luther had to say, agreed with him on many points, and when he knew that they were coming to, uh, with the plan of killing him, to execute him, Frederick the Wise had Martin Luther kidnapped and, and hid him in his castle. And Luther at that time didn't know what was going on. That's the, the Luther who you know, said, we, I stand, I will not recant. But he was stuck in this castle for 10 months. And so he wrote a lot, but he used a pseudonym. And as a result of the time that he spent in that castle, nothing to do, he translated the Bible into the German language, the first that had ever been done from Greek. Martin Luther understood what was important. So, he would struggle to understand how to translate a certain Greek um, sentence or phrase, and he would go into the town to hear the common people talking, and he would hear someone say something in German that exactly fit that Greek. And so, he translated it into the common language. And he was greatly criticized. And he understood that you can't translate word for word from Greek to German. That it takes a lot of work. In the same way you're going from English to American Sign Language. Of course you're going to get criticized for the translation that you do. Well, time is moving along. Um, we will get to Zwingli later. You can take a picture of it and talk about it later. And John Calvin, uh, Yari Sabalainen, will be preaching more about him tomorrow. But the key writing for John Calvin was the Institute of the Christian Religion, which was the first Protestant systematic theology written from a Protestant perspective. So, dealing with topics of God, the church, man, faith, etc., etc., put into a systematic order. And that allowed people to learn theology. Another key <laughs> to Calvin is that he believed that churches should have the right to vote for their, who they wanted to have as a leader. That the people within the church voted for who would be the elders in their congregation. And that is clearly the influence of John Calvin that we do that today.
that has been a great impact on our American government. Our American government uh, comes from John Calvin's church government, that representative government. government. We sent somebody to Washington as our representative in the same way that you think a representative as your elder. So briefly look at some of the results of the Reformation. And I want to look at three major impacts the Reformation has had in terms of our doctrine. The first is the primary authority of God's Word in the Bible. <coughs> that we preach God's Word, that we change through God's Word, that we challenge through God's Word, that everything comes through God's Word is our authority. The second one is that people are saved through faith in Christ. Not faith plus good works. We are saved by faith alone. The Catholic Church said that we are saved by faith plus works. A combination of the two. Uh, faith in Christ and my good works will get me to heaven. Protestants clearly taught that the salvation can only found, be found in Jesus Christ who saves us. And thirdly, the priesthood of all believers. That is that we can read the Bible. Not only pastors, that the everyday people in the churches can read the Bible for themselves. We can be like the Bereans. Remember the story of the Bereans? Paul went to preach there. And they would look in the scriptures to make sure that what Paul was teaching was correct before accepting it. And we are to be like those Bereans as well. That when we see or preaching, instead of accepting it blindly, make sure that it matches with what the scripture teaches. That it would in other words, your pastor and your preaching must pass the Bible test. So ask him if your preacher says something he doesn't give you scripture, ask him where in the Bible that is. And you have a right to do that because of the priesthood of all believers. That's one thing we're thankful to John Calvin for. And so the preaching of the Bible was returned. The worship of God was returned. People who went to church without understanding stopped. They went in worship. As many doctrines were corrected. Praise the Lord. Amen. So I just want to show, um, I'm going to show a video, a 20 minute video of my um, visit to Germany. And some of the uh, signing is kind of small because my wife, she is not a certified filmographer. So um, we were so excited we got home and found that some of it we just couldn't see. I said, to my, hey, I'm not a pro. So are we ready to do this? I want to move up closer if you're sitting in the back. That's up to you. Uh, because it's not that easy to see at some points. I'm not sure we're going to be able to interpret a lot of this. 